I was put in touch with someone who had an exceedingly rare Apple prototype needing repair. It dates back to 1992 and was an early example of a tablet computer the company had in development. I had never seen anything like it before. And there's a good chance you haven't either. There aren't any markings, but it looked vaguely familiar. It has a similar design language to the Mac PowerBooks from the time, but clearly lacks a keyboard. A couple elements stood out as ones I'd seen before, specifically this arrangement of brightness and contrast buttons on the front bezel. The bigger one, though, is the interface connector on the back. Apple used this on only one series, the PowerBook Duo. And the more I worked on the prototype, the clearer its lineage would become. The first question to tackle was if this thing still worked. Vintage Mac laptops with dead batteries will typically power themselves on automatically when connected to power, but this one didn't. The front right corner has an ADB port for keyboard or mouse, which was not a feature that Duos had, but I was told it had been added to the prototype to make development and troubleshooting easier. So I hooked up a keyboard and pressed the power button, but nothing happened. Production PowerBook Duos have a power button on the back, but it was missing on this unit. I spotted a microswitch hiding inside this hole at the top corner of the screen, but peeking inside the computer revealed that its wires went nowhere. On Duos, there would be a PCB connected to this header that would often contain a 14.4 modem, along with power and reset buttons. And while the prototype has a hole in the back where a phone line could connect, the board was missing. I happened to have a PowerBook Duo 280 parts machine. It was too broken to be worth restoring, but it did have a more basic version of that card which omitted the modem circuitry. I dropped it in, but pressing the button still didn't yield any signs of life. Why was this thing dead? I decided to focus on the hard drive while I considered my options, specifically trying to capture a disk image of it. These old SCSI laptop drives are prone to failure, so time was of the essence. My Duo 270C was pressed into service to help with the data recovery. Thankfully, the ribbon cables were the same, so I could simply connect the prototype's drive in place of its own. I used a special cable to connect the Duo to another PowerBook, a newer G3 model. This would put the Duo into SCSI disk mode, which basically makes it act like an external hard drive. And while the Duo powered up into that mode, when I checked in drive setup on the G3, the disk never showed up. In fact, the G3 would get stuck trying to scan the SCSI bus. I was confident my Duo was working properly, but not as much about the drive from the prototype. It seemed to be spinning up, but that was it. I swapped the flat flex cables between the two drives out of curiosity, but no luck. The problem kept happening. Time for another plan. I had an external SCSI CD-ROM drive that I could disassemble for its enclosure. The internal mechanism used a standard 50-pin ribbon cable, so I bought an adapter that would let me convert it to the smaller pinout the laptop drive needed. The SCSI ID gets set through jumpers on the adapter. Then I got it hooked up to the enclosure, and before I connected it to the G3, I powered it on to listen to the drive by itself. It spun up, but the heads never tried to seek as they should, and after a few seconds, the drive gave up and spun itself down. That explained the behavior I'd seen when it was connected through the Duo, and meant one thing. The actuator assembly inside the drive was stuck. I've seen this before, and while it's often a straightforward repair, it can be a bit nerve-wracking. In general, it's a bad idea to physically open a mechanical drive unless you're in a special clean room environment, because any dust that lands inside can damage it. But the data density of the platters in drives this old is low enough that this isn't quite as big of a deal. As long as I tried to keep the area relatively dust-free and worked quickly, I had a good chance of at least not making anything worse. There's always some risk, but I had the prototype owner's blessing to give it a shot. With the top voice coil magnet removed, I could carefully rotate the platters while moving the armature. 
to free up room to remove this end stop bracket. Inside it is a small piece of rubber that the armature bumps into when it reaches the end of its travel or when the drive is parked. But like lots of other decades old rubber parts, over time it's gotten sticky and kept the armature from rotating. The voice coil that moves it isn't terribly strong. Since new replacement parts aren't available, I applied a piece of Kapton tape over the bumper so the arm wouldn't stick to it. I'm thankful that this was the only thing seemingly wrong with the drive. I've read horror stories from others where the gasket around the drive's cover turns to goo and gets all over the platters themselves. And there's no way to fix that. So with the drive back together, time to test it on its own again. I turned the enclosure on and the drive spun up. Then I could hear the head seek and the drive stayed spinning. That's definitely progress, but did it actually fix the problem? I got the SCSI cable connected between the enclosure and my power book, then booted it up. And when it got to the desktop, the external drive had mounted successfully. I wasn't sure how much time I had to work with the drive. It could stay running for the foreseeable future or die within minutes. So I immediately fired up the disk copy program to capture an image. That fix to the bumper seemed to be all the drive needed, but to be safe, I rebooted the PowerBook into OS X so I could capture another image a different way. The DD command will create a block by block copy of a source drive, including its partition information and I figured this would be the most complete way to archive it. If necessary, the image file could be written to another disk, which would then behave exactly like the original. I had gotten incredibly lucky that the prototype's drive hadn't been in worse condition, and I was thankful that the repair had gone exactly as I'd hoped. But I wasn't done fixing things on the machine just yet. I still had to figure out why it didn't want to boot. I inspected the motherboard since some kind of component failure was the most likely culprit. Being a prototype, there were a ton of bodge wires that wouldn't have been there in a production PowerBook Duo. But looking closer, I spotted some that didn't seem to be related to any of the added on parts. They look like the kind of modifications that are meant to fix problems with the board itself. Sometimes this is necessary when PCBs are found to have errors after they've gone into production, but these felt a bit more ad hoc. Another thing that caught my eye was this blue, oddly shaped daughter board. There were no markings on it other than an Apple copyright of 1992 and a label with F5 handwritten on it. I couldn't help my curiosity, so I carefully pried it free. What I found was a set of flash chips. The PCB appeared to be a way to interface them to the motherboard, but considering the machine came with a hard drive, they weren't likely meant to be used for primary storage. The connector for it on the motherboard was set within the footprint of where a chip would go. And that made me realize there were no ROM chips like one would see in a production duo. This PCB then was used only during development. Prototype motherboards were fitted with these connectors instead of ROM chips, and because the daughter board had flash memory, software engineers could quickly and easily write new ROM revisions for testing. If the bodge wires and flash-based ROM weren't enough to suggest this motherboard was a prototype itself, then this sealed the deal. The CPU wasn't a normal part either. The lowest end model in the series, the PowerBook Duo 210, shipped with a 25 MHz 68030 processor. But this chip was the 16 MHz version, which was never used in any model of Duo. What's more, it appears to have been hand-soldered which suggests that engineers were experimenting with different CPU options. The motherboard went by the internal codename Metropolis with the dock connector called Daily Planet and the RAM expansion interface labeled as Lois Lane. That ROM daughter card thus had the fitting name Lena Lang. The most likely reason the machine didn't boot though was a typical one for computers of this vintage, failed capacitors. I spotted what looked like some leaking electrolyte, so in order to prevent further damage to the machine, I got out my hot air reflow station and removed them. They generally came out without a fuss, but there were a couple of spots that concerned me. One pad had suffered some corrosion, and another had lifted entirely. The rest cleaned up very well, and it's fortunate that I was able to catch this in time before things got worse. I soldered new caps in their place, 
The lifted pad was easy to work around, as the via it connected to was close by. I tried powering the machine on again, but still no luck. No signs of life at all. I checked the voltage input with a multimeter and it looked good, but a closer look at the added on ADB port gave me one answer. The power on signal on Classic Max uses a dedicated fourth pin on the connector, but this one only has three wires hooked up. I still wasn't sure why the modem board's power button didn't work, but I had one trick left up my sleeve. The PowerBook Duo series was a modular system by nature. The machines could be used on their own, of course, but also as part of a docking station. And those docks, for convenience, often included their own power buttons to start up the system. I happened to have a spare Duo Mini dock that was working, but in somewhat rough condition. And it potentially could be the key to get the prototype running. Problem was, the two weren't exactly compatible. While the machine did include a dock connector, it lacked something that other duos had. A pair of holes on either side for the dock's locking pins. Obviously, I wasn't going to modify the prototype to add them, so that meant any changes needed to be made to the dock itself. I took apart the mini dock and was able to separate the latching mechanism from the electrical connector. Looks like this dock must have been stored in a damp place for a while, as the connector's outer shield had gotten a bit rusty. I got it unclipped and dropped into a container of vinegar to soak for a while. Some rust had gotten on the connector itself, but since its pins were gold-plated, it wiped right off. Next, I turned back to the latch assembly. The handle separates from the bracket that holds the pins. They appeared to be just press fit, so I wrapped them in tape and used a pair of pliers to work them loose. This way I could undo the changes later if I needed to. An old toothbrush helped get the rust scraped off the connector shield, and while the vinegar did a good job getting it broken down, the rust still left a permanent mark on the shield's plating. It's not pretty, but at least the risk of flaking rust damaging the dock connector was now gone. Finally, I got the unit reassembled. I had to leave out the handle and latch assembly, but the bracket needed to go back in as it's what supports the connector itself. Ultimately, it went together without a problem, and in the end, I had a mini dock that was missing its fangs. One last check on things inside the prototype before I tried it with the dock. It had come to me with the display disconnected, and at first I couldn't quite figure out how exactly to hook it back up. There were two flat flex cables coming from different sides of the screen. I suspected one of them was for the video signal and another was for the touch screen. I plugged in the ribbon that had a matching connector on the motherboard, which was also the same place that production duos had their displays attach. The modified mini dock plugged into the computer without a hitch, and when I pressed the power button, the machine sprang to life. But the screen wasn't looking so hot. I looked closer at the display cables and realized what was going on. It turns out that both of them are needed to drive the screen. The second cable had part of its connector broken off, which at first I thought was damaged from rough handling, but it turns out it was intentional, so that it could fit the connector on the motherboard. It was a bit tricky to get both plugged in, but when I powered the machine up again, I got much better results. Definite signs of progress here. The cursor showed up, and the blinking question mark was expected, as I hadn't hooked the hard drive back up yet. But the bottom half of the display was garbled, and the upper right corner was just plain blank. So clearly, I still had some more work to do. I took apart the screen to see what could be wrong. The housing was held together with nylon screws, and I had to release some tape holding down a couple of wire harnesses. But taking the back cover off and gingerly feeding the cables through the cutouts revealed a lot more hand-assembled circuitry. The display's inverter board was a hot mess, definitely a prototype part. I focused on inspecting the ribbon cables, as they were a more likely cause for the display issues I was seeing, and sure enough, I found one with some damage. The nature of prototypes like these mean that they're often put together just enough to work, but not necessarily be durable. Clearly, these ribbon cables were a bit of an afterthought, in that they were just barely long enough, and also routed in a way that they could be damaged if the unit was disassembled frequently. This was also a problem in that the ribbon itself was likely a prototype part, so I couldn't just scavenge one from another computer. 
It's possible to repair tears and flat flex cables like this, but it had been a while since I last tried it, so I opted to practice on a scrap cable first. I was able to scrape off the polyamid coating using a craft knife to expose the copper traces so that solder could stick. I sliced through a couple of traces to simulate the damage to the prototype's cable, then taped the practice piece to my work mat with some capped on tape and applied flux. Then it was a matter of carefully drag soldering across the break in order to bridge the two sides back together. This went reasonably well, and I was able to confirm with my multimeter that there was continuity where it should be. So on to the real thing. I disconnected it from the screen and found that it was indeed handmade. Someone had clearly just cut the end of length, scraped back the coating, and tinned the traces. I taped the cable to the desk, then carefully exposed the copper on both sides of the break. Looks like three traces had been severed by the tear. I repeated the same drag soldering process, and while the results weren't pretty, it worked. I wrapped the area in more Kapton tape to protect it, and was thankful that the tear wasn't near an area where the cable needed to bend. If that was the case, I'd probably have had to scrape further back and use thin bodge wires instead. With the screen reassembled and the hard drive back in, the machine booted to the desktop, and the display corruption had completely cleared up. I did find that the upper corner still wasn't working quite right, but also that the problem was intermittent. Sometimes it looked just fine, then blinked out for a bit, and came back. I decided I had poked and prodded this poor prototype profusely enough as it was, so letting that small problem remain wasn't such a big deal. I had pushed my luck several times with this thing, and I wanted to stop before it ran out. For the sake of preservation, I wanted to dump a copy of the machine's ROM. I had a utility called Copy ROMs on Floppy, and running it generated a file called Duo230. But that also revealed this machine was having a bit of an identity crisis. About this Mac said the machine was a Duo210, and SCSI Probe had no idea what kind of computer it was. It's fitting, then, that the ROM would be just as unfinished as the hardware it ran on. Yet the ultimate question still remained. Just what is this thing? Who made it? And why? And what happened? As it turns out, this prototype is just the tip of the iceberg. Its history is a fascinating journey into a part of Apple seldom talked about. One that we'll dive into next time. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. Here's another episode you may want to check out. And as always, thanks for watching.